welcome to PKF O'Connor Davies podcast, Nonprofits Insight Out. I'm Lenore Sanchez, Audit Manager specializing in not for profit organizations. Today's topic is international activities conducted by nonprofit organizations. Joining us today to provide insight on this topic are Garrett Higgins and Eva Mruck. Garrett serves as the partner in charge of PKF O'Connor Davies Exempt Organization Tax and Advisory Services Group and serves as a member on the firm's executive committee. Nice to be here today, Lenore. Thanks, we're so happy to have you. And Eva is also a partner serving in the firm's Exempt Organization Tax and Advisory Services Group. Thank you for having us here today. Of course. Both Garrett and Eva have 25 years experience providing tax compliance and advisory service to nonprofit organizations. Garrett and Eva, nonprofit organizations work so hard to raise the funds that they have to uh, carry out their mission. And many times their mission goes beyond the location of the organization, and in many instances, worldwide. Can you speak to some of the ways in which organizations engage in international activities? Sure. Nonprofits today have a global reach and conduct global activities in several ways. First way is programmatically, operating programs in other countries. Giving grants is a second way, giving grants to organizations that further their mission in other countries and through diversification of their portfolio, their endowments, their invest in foreign entities. Well, you mentioned programs and grant making which entail charitable activities. Can you speak to the type of charitable activities that are conducted offshore as well as some of the key considerations for organizations that they should keep in mind? Not-for-profits conduct direct programs overseas and more often than not, global reach is the goal for many. Because the not-for-profit is creating a taxable presence in the foreign country, it goes without saying that there are a lot of moving parts and it it involves a lot of accountability. It comes with its own set of requirements and complexities, so understanding the rules when operating abroad is critically important. A domestic not-for-profit can conduct the same exempt activities in a foreign country as it does in the United States. A not-for-profit can operate all or some of its programs physically in a foreign country. For example, they could be operating a school, a clinic, or an economic development program. There are a number of considerations. So one, there's the people side of things. Who is going to be involved? The boots on the ground, so to say. So will there be US citizens living offshore or will the operations be staffed by foreign nationals? So it could be a combination of both. Then there's also independent contractors or agents that need to be hired, locations, offices, and that may be driven based on a demand for a certain region to operate in. So choosing the country uh, comes with a, a number of rules, legal and regulatory frameworks to adhere to, restrictions, licensing, and other considerations. So engaging in legal counsel or international tax experts is advisable. Great, thank you for sharing that. There certainly is a lot for the nonprofit organizations to think about and the IRS um, has really been focusing on the international activities performed by nonprofits for quite some time. Can you talk about whether or not charitable giving receives greater IRS scrutiny than other activities performed? I'll jump in here. The real question is, we all know that nonprofits can provide grants to organizations, whether domestically or internationally. And the IRS wants to make sure that the giving of those grants are first in line with the exempt organization's mission. They look to the application for exemption, where an organization described what its purpose was, what what it intended to do what the IRS gave them exempt 
um, exemption for they want to make sure that grants are to a charitable class rather than an individual to guard against private benefit, private inurement. A classic example of this would be if somebody came down with cancer, and we always see organizations wanting to start and, and say that in the name of that person, fund. Well, that fund can't just be opened for that individual because that's private benefit for a private individual. However, what can happen is an organization can be formed, you know, John Doe's Fund, to address that particular type of cancer and all cancer patients of that type. Um, the only deviation from this is where an organization, a nonprofit, can give a grant is disaster relief. So if we have a fire in an area, you just can't restore and give benefits to the people of a, an affected area, a couple of houses. It has to be to a, 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 a large enough, definitive class of individuals, say, say in a region. So uh, we saw this in the pandemic recently, where you just couldn't open it up for restaurants in a particular uh, little town. It was had to be a larger area, New York City, for instance. So IRS, when they look at grant giving, they look at all these things as a whole. Does it address the mission of the organization? Is it the, to a charitable class? Is it broad enough and indefinite? Um, and that's, those are the things they look at. All right, well, that's very um, helpful to understand the way that you um, gave those examples. Thank you. And oftentimes donors um, will make a contribution and they'll want it to go to a specific purpose. Can you talk about the concepts of earmarking or conduit restrictions? So you need to tread lightly here, Lenore. So when a donor, as we all know, look, at, think about the Internal Revenue Code, and a donor, whether corporate or individual trust, that wants to give to a charity, normally they have to give to a 501c3 registered with the IRS to get a charitable deduction. And a lot of times they say, I want to give to this organization, but I want it to go for a purpose. That's okay. So if you have an organization whose purpose is education and you want it to go to low income housing uh, opportunities in education, you can have a purpose restricted. However, if you give it to an organization and say, I, I want it to go to this person, that is considered earmarking, which is not allowed. Again, that private inurement. A donor, when they give a donation, has no expectation of receiving a benefit in return, no strings attached. I gave the donation because I wanted to do good. But having control over that donation after the donation is given is not permitted. Um, you know, you do see examples of donor advised funds, but even in those examples, when you give to a donor advised fund, you have advisory privileges. But make no mistake about that, donor advised fund can turn around and say no. And when you're looking at international activities, when you give to a U.S. entity, so you can give to a, a church and say, I want it to go to the Vatican. Well, you really can't do that either because the, it, it circumvents the tax rule. You cannot use a U.S. charity to accomplish the same thing by circumventing the tax rules. So you can't use them as, as a conduit. And to add to that, many foreign-based charities choose to create an American-based not-for-profit. They're commonly referred to as a friends of organization. These type of organizations help support the foreign organization through charitable giving. So they're used as a philanthropic vehicle. However, important to note, the foreign corporation should not control or participate in the Friends of Organization. Generally, it is not looked upon favorably by the IRS, and that's, that's to put it my, my mildly. The Friends of Organization cannot be organized or operated solely as a conduit to solicit earmarked funds, as mentioned earlier. Um, and that legal separation must exist. So the Friends of organization must be operated independently of the foreign organization that it supports. The governing body 
is required to oversee all activities and retain full authority over grant making and financial decision making. Uh, so the Friends of organization cannot be a pass-through or even be perceived to be a pass-through uh, to funnel money or in essence it may jeopardize its tax exemption. That's a lot to keep in mind. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, how would not-for-profits uh, help ensure that they safely engage in the grant-making activities? Grant-making activities can be made, you know, grants can be made by any type of organization. And depending on the type, there are certain rules. So take, for instance, a private foundation, a grant-making foundation that makes grants. It can make grants to um, U.S. entities, which they typically do, but they can also make grants uh, abroad. And when they do make a grant abroad or to a non-charitable entity, the Treasury regulations call for what's called expenditure, expenditure responsibility. And basically, it, it, it creates a safe harbor as long as they follow three rules. They learn about the organization, a pre-grant inquiry, learning about the organization that they're giving to and the purposes they're giving for. Then there's a written grant agreement. A written grant agreement explains what, what purposes the grant is being given for, what, what purposes it can be using, money used for, what happens if all the money's not used that has to come back and also has prohibitive language. What purposes are prohibited to be to, for use of that money, such as political intervention, lobbying, but those are clearly articulated in the Treasury regulations for a private foundation. It's a type of 501c3. For public charities, that they, they also can give grants, or even non-public charities, they uh, give grants. The 990, has some pro questions about the monitoring, the use of the funds. And it requires reporting from the grantee back to the grantor over the use of the funds. On the 990, there's probing questions, whether it be domestic grant or international grant. There's similar questions. How did the organization select the individual or organization that received the money? How did they oversee and receive reporting back so they know that the funds were used for their intended purpose and that's how the IRS gets comfortable with the type of organization they gave to the way the organizations um, uh, maintain oversight over the use of those funds to ensure that it's used for charitable purposes. Garrett, another way you mentioned that nonprofits can engage in international activities is through foreign investing. Can you provide some insight related to that? So, as you said, another way is through investing. And, and what we see is a lot of nonprofit organizations, those with large endowments, even those with, with modest endowments, have investment committees. And their charge really is to diversify that portfolio. And that includes international investing. Private foundations have whole investment teams to invest that money so they can make grants to, in the future. So what we're seeing is international investing, and the IRS knows about this. Pension vehicles, foundations, universities, they're all investing and leveraging diversity and maximizing rate of return. But this brings a whole host of compliance requirements. The IRS is aware that these nonprofits, these larger nonprofits, are investing and they're capturing this information in that probing document called the 990. Um, the 990 PF hasn't been revised yet, but I anticipate when the time comes, there will be similar reporting, similar probing questions on that new form uh, when, when, when that is created too. And the last thing I'll mention is many organizations may have bank accounts offshore, whether they have programs, whether they leverage um, and, and invest through, through foreign bank accounts. There's also FBAR reporting. That's not only, it's, it's, it's monitored by the IRS, but it really is the Department of Treasury that's concerned there. Again, it was born out of the individuals, the Swiss bank accounts that we always hear about. Um, and, and, you know, failure to comply 
with these rules and regulations, even if you're a nonprofit, can have very stiff penalties. So, um, you know, nonprofits, although they have good intentions of diversifying and getting that maximum rate of return, also have to ask themselves, what are the risk factors? And one is compliance risk. Thank you for that insight. Eva, earlier Garrett mentioned the Treasury Department. Is the IRS the only agency that nonprofits should be concerned about when it comes to having their international activities scrutinized? Well, there's no question that foreign activities are a high focus with the IRS and at the center of attention with the IRS. But to answer your question, no, the IRS isn't the only agency of the U.S. Department of Treasury that oversees foreign activity. The Office of Foreign Assets Control, also known as OFAC, that's an agency that administers and enforces economic and trade sanctions, and it protects national security. So in a nutshell, OFAC determines where a not-for-profit can and cannot operate, and with whom a not-for-profit can or cannot work with. So not-for-profits should be very vigilant what the OFAC sanctions are. And these sanctions were, were instituted after the wake of 9-11 with terrorism. The president issued a U.S. executive order that blocks property and prohibits transactions with persons and entities. And um, with entities who threaten or support terrorism, it's the U.S. Patriot Act. So because U.S. not-for-profits must be very careful not to violate any restrictions against the transfer of assets to a sanctioned country or operate in a sanctioned country without an approval or a license from OFAC, there are certain screening and vetting that should take place. Uh, so not-for-profits should create internal policies or a set of procedures to follow each time, for example, funds are being paid to foreign entities. So that screen, screening and that vetting process uh, is very important. The information you both shared with us, um, Garrett and Eva, is extremely valuable and insightful for nonprofits conducting or anticipating conducting international activities. Do either one of you happen to have any closing remarks? So Lenore, as you can see, international activity is a high focus priority area of the IRS. Their goal is, I'm going to say multifold. That's why there's so many different, not only IRS, but other regulatory agencies are concerned about it. From an IRS, IRS perspective, the use of the funds, the protection of charitable assets, the making sure that those funds offshore, whether programmatic, whether investing, but the grant making are used to further the mission of the nonprofit, that they address a charitable class of individual and there's no private benefit. In addition, the funds are not used to fund illegal non-charitable activity, which includes the funding of terroristic organizations. Garrett and Eva, thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. It was my pleasure. Great to be here today. PKFO with Connor Davies serves a wide range of nonprofits. And for more information or to find Eva or Garrett's contact information, please visit our website at pkfod.com. Until next time, nonprofits, insight out.